Hi, Paul Gerard, back again for another video in our Investor Channel series. This video is going to address franking credits, and we're going to explain them. Um, many investors see the words franking credits and think, of, well, I'll get a tax credit, etc., but lack the knowledge and understanding of just quite how they work. So we're going to try and uh, dumb it down a bit, keep it simple, but also try and explain and educate you on what franking credits are and how they benefit or might not benefit you. Okay, so in an earlier video, we explored the different types of investment from shares, ETFs and managed funds. Now, some dividends and some distributions from trusts, etc., will have the expression franked and will come with franking credits. Uh, it can be a bit confusing, I'll admit. Um, so we want to simplify it and explain just where franking comes from, what it is, and what its consequences are. So, franking credits are a concept introduced, introduced by Treasurer Paul Keating in the Hawke era. It's been going on for a while. Prior to that time, dividend income was taxed in the hands of the shareholder at their marginal tax rate. One issue many disagreed on was the way double taxation occurred. So let's consider what that really means. So using a simple example, let's assume that BHP Limited produces a profit of $1,000 and it pays tax on that of 30%. And so in the simple terms, let's assume its bank account then contains $700. And it decides to pay a dividend to its shareholders and they are also taxed at 30 cents in the dollars. So the total tax on that same income is effectively 60%. So the franking credit regime seeks to unwind some of that. So that under the franking regime, BHP instead pays a franked dividend of $700. And let's just simplify this and assume its shareholders are two individuals with incomes of nothing and $40,000 respectively. So let's call them A and B. And let's use the present day tax rates. Just keep it simple. So A would have a taxable income of $350, plus the addition of the franking credit is also taxed. So, so their taxable income is $500. The tax on that is zero, and therefore the franking credit of $150 is refundable. B, however, would have taxable income of $40,500. The tax on this is $3,979.50, less the tax credit of $150. And let's assume that they've also got some tax withheld on their salary of four grand. So their marginal rate of tax is actually, in this situation, 21%. So they're paying tax on that dividend and they get a partial refund of the franking because their marginal rate slightly exceeds that of what the company's paid. Okay. A higher income taxpayer on the top marginal rate pays 47% tax on the 500 and they get the same $150 tax credit which would leave them with a shortfall of $85 or 17%. So we've got to think of franking credits as refundable for some, tax paid for some, at up to 30%, or you will pay additional tax at your marginal rate, but only on the difference. So for example, if you're on the top rate, 47, you'll pay an extra 17, not, you don't have to pay it all over again. So franking avoids double taxation of the same income in, a, in its simplest form, okay? The marginal tax rate of the taxpayer means those who sit on the top, on the tax scale above 30% generally face a shortfall of some form and a gap remains and further is payable and those on rates under may even get a full or partial uh, benefit of refund. And this is reflected in this for very simple taxpayers who produce no income other than franking income, they can even fill in a simplified tax form which is a refund or franking credits request form where they list out the companies and the various franked amounts etc they lodge that in lieu of a tax return we sometimes see that with retirees 
um, who might hold a very modest amount of investment income, well under the tax-free threshold, and they do so merely to get the refund of the franking credits without having to pay an agent. Tax planning should always consider the impact of tax on income and capital gains for this reason. Okay, so but it can be a benefit for a non-working spouse to, to be the investor rather than a higher income earner. So this is why trust can be attractive. This is why investing in the name of a spouse might be attractive. You've just got to consider whether there's net income or losses, for example, if you're claiming interest deductions and the like. So I hoped that has helped address your knowledge on franking credits and why and how they work. So until another video, bye. See you next time.